All right, that little button means we are live. Welcome everybody that is tuning in today. It is the first Wednesday of the month. Uh, hump Day Hangout, focus on training. Uh, we have a great topic today. We're gonna talk about officer development programs, some of, the, some of the successes that we've had within our organization, some of the challenges that we face all throughout the fire service with officer development, certainly a, a frequently talked about uh, item, and uh, some of the things that maybe we hope that we can do as far as officer development goes so within our departments and, and in the broader fire service and some goals that we have. So uh, welcome everybody. My name's Brad French. I'm a captain in the Dayton, Ohio Fire Department. I'm also on the board of directors for the International Society of Fire Service Instructors, the ISFSI. Uh, we're pleased, as always, uh, to, to be a part of this first Wednesday of the month uh, hump day hangout with uh, with Clarion of Fire Engineering. Uh, normally, uh, if, if Bobby were here, I would kick it over to him uh, for a little bit of an intro. He may join us at some point uh, as well. And uh, also one of our other co-hosts, Steve Pegram, uh, past president of ISFSI and current chief down in Goshen, Ohio, uh, may jump on and join us as well as we progress here. And if so, we'll tag him in uh, as well. A couple of things to keep in mind as we go uh, throughout the next hour or so of discussion. Keep in mind that we'll follow along on social media. I'll try to uh, to follow as well as uh, the other panelists can follow along if they can. And some of the uh, fire engineering folks in the background can kick us some questions that are asked using the hashtag FE talk, hashtag FE talk on social media. Uh, so with that being said, I think we'll uh, we'll kind of you know cut some of the normal uh, um, you know uh, you know discussion about FDIC and stuff like that because we're kind of in the off off time period from that at the moment. Uh, congratulations to to everybody tuning in that that was uh, selected to go forward with FDIC. If you weren't, uh, which I, I know a lot of fantastic folks that were not. Keep at it. Uh, I, I frequently see things on social media from uh, Bill Carey, from from various other folks that are involved. Uh, you know, Rick Lasky and folks that are involved in the in that selection process to try to do the best you can to uh, stay involved and stay at it. Lots of people get rejection uh, letters for FDIC and uh, they stay at it. I, I've, I've heard, you know, stories about Bobby Halton getting rejection letters and Alan Brunacini getting rejection letters and things like that. So uh, anybody out there that's tuning in that tried and did not get it this year, please stay after it for next year. Uh, that's always a very hard process, I'm sure. I don't envy them at all having to go through all that. So, uh, but that's our, you know, we typically talk a little bit at the beginning about FDIC and that's kind of where we're at with that right now is that those selections have, have gone out and uh, we'll be getting ready to go for next year. A little bit earlier in the uh, season, I believe, for FDIC, I see next year, I think we're maybe first full week of April or something like that, whereas we're usually mid to late April. So certainly something to make sure you have on your calendars for 2019 FDIC International. Uh, so with that, I will kick it over to our panelists and we'll just do a quick intro down the line of who everybody is and where they're from. If you tune into these on a regular basis, you're certainly already going to notice a lot of these familiar names and faces from some of our other hump day hangouts. But we'll do a quick intro and then we'll get into uh, a little bit of discussion about officer development programs. So, Aaron, I'll go to you. All right. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, great to be with everybody again. September is a big month for us. You know, with the 11th coming up next week and everything that goes into it. So uh, and we don't want that to be forgotten by any means. And I'm sure there'll be plenty and plenty of reminders on social media. But, um, yeah, uh, my name is Aaron Heller. I'm a captain in Hamilton, New Jersey. Uh, actually working today and hoping we're slow for another hour. And um, also served as a volunteer in a, in a department not far from here for many, many years. So, uh trying to look at officer development from two sides of the coin, from the volunteers and the career side of it. And uh, those are both a little bit, a uh, little bit interesting. Um, that being said, uh, as far as FDIC goes, I can tell you that I did get my hot class, which was a thrill, but one of my, my classroom presentation was rejected this year. So that's, um, that's the facts of it. So like, like Brad said, stay with it, stay with it and keep pushing. And uh, you know, that's that's where we are. Uh, hey, Chief. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, how's it going? Good. Sorry we're late. No, that's quite all right. Uh, good, to, good to see your faces. It was his fault. Uh, my fault. This is Deputy Chief John Wentel from the Owasso Fire Department, uh, formerly with Tulsa. Uh, Owasso covers the uh, northern border of the city of Tulsa. Right. And uh, does a lot of mutual aid with my volunteer company out here. And... Uh, Occasionally, I, I visit with uh, the good folks at Owasso. They're a pretty progressive organization. Um, the folks that follow us, we did a tour of a uh, facility uh, on a hangout, I don't know, probably six months ago? Uh, about right, about six months ago. So John and I might cut out later and send some footage of, uh, 
of where they are today. They're building a, it's a, for the, obviously for this hangout, it's really perfect because we're, it's what it is, Brad, is a uh, combination headquarters and training facility. So John has actually designed a neighborhood behind it with a commercial building and homes and right. what else you got back there? Well, we're going to have three residential structures. One of them is going to be 3,000 square feet with two stories. We've got 1,800 square foot, single story, and then we've got a 1,500 square foot ranch style. Uh, one is class A to it. The others are, are propane burns. And then we've got a kind of a, uh, a one-off taxpayer, if you will, in the back on the backside, three-story little taxpayers. So. so, of course, we're going to want the uh, society to come down and do a uh, class on live fire and things of that nature. We're going to have to have Aaron come down with his team and do their commercial deal. And, of course, Joe, we'd love to have you come down and do uh, – have Joe Pernesti come down and do his uh, famous Main Street work and uh, be really be helpful because um, – Everything that every John and I have been hanging out now for two, 20, 15, 20 years since I got up here and uh, met him when we first got here. And uh, it was with Tulsa then. Yes. And uh, so we've done a lot of stuff. The Tulsa Academy is amazing, too. Uh, I've spoken with them. Uh, one of the things, Brad, I'll, I'll make sure to get a, a nice tour of that facility. It's amazing. And they do a lot of uh, a lot of folks come in and train there, um, you know, from, from our from our network. So. A great opportunity for the IFSI uh, Instructor Society. Obviously, you know, any, any, all your courses. Love to have you come down and work with the uh, Owasso, and uh, we're tied in. We're, we're one family out here as far as the fire service goes. It's seamless between Owasso and Tulsa, and and really all the communities out here. Whether it's Rogers and, the, and all the good volunteer crews that are out here in Limestone and and uh, Sky Took and all the other good folks, and uh, and and they're several paid jobs, Collinsville and uh, Claire Moore and uh, some other really, really amazing people. So sorry for the long introduction. I apologize. Oh, no, no, not at all. We really, we are uh, happy to, happy to see your faces pop on there and, and, uh, and nice to have you with us as well, Chief. Um, and uh, the uh, topic of the day, I'm sure uh, Chief Halton let you know is going to be, oh, I think we lost the camera. There we go. Uh, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be officer development. So we'll talk about some best practices for officer development programs and things like that. Uh, one more thing, Chief, uh, Chief Halton, while we've got you, we were just kind of starting with our introductions and, and I was talking a little bit about the fact that FDIC is a little bit earlier in April next year than it usually is. Is, is that, uh, is that correct? Well, yeah, you know, so one of the things we do with, with the FDIC is we look ahead to all the major events, right? So we kind of have to plan around, you have to remember Indianapolis is one of the uh, uh, stomping grounds of the NCAA, of the NFL, of all of that good stuff, right? And then there's God. God has this holiday right around that time of year called Easter. And, and we always consult with God and ask him, you know, what, what would he like us to do there? And for our Jewish friends, it's the same God. We, we, we're talking about the son and the dad and all that good stuff. So, and, and for our Muslim friends, it's the first book. So it's kind of all the same gig. So anyway, we work around that holiday. So we can tell you when FDIC is going to be in Indianapolis about five years out. And so when we looked at this upcoming um, uh, uh, FDIC 19, uh, maneuvering around the NCAA and the NFL and, and all our other good friends out there, these were the best dates for us. So, and, and obviously with the religious holidays and there's many other religious holidays, I apologize if I've forgotten anyone else's. I, I, I just celebrate my own, so shame on me, I guess. But I'm a Catholic, so I can do that kind of stuff. And we're, being a Catholic means you could really don't care. So I'm just kidding. But the, so anyway, and, and you're Baptist. Or, he's, no, you're not, he's not a Catholic. I was like, see, we're all Catholic. <laughs> meet me on the That's front right. door. Of the, he actually yeah. built my church. I forgot. That's right. He built the church I go to. He actually, he actually did build the church I go to. Well. So anyway, long story <laughs> monotonous. Um, yeah, uh, officer development, I think, is a great topic for today because as I look at this crowd, um, it's an interesting phenomenon, and to just kind of kick it off uh, with Brad, as we go through the fire service, how every organization handles it is a little bit different, right? A little bit parochial, which is okay. I mean, we, we all rail against systems. I read a great piece today. I think Brad will, and Aaron will love this one. A young man sent me a piece, great young man. And he said, you know, we have to quit arguing and with each other and all that stuff. And I said, like, good luck. Smooth bore versus fog, you know, big, big, Jackets worth it, you know, and, and my dad used to say, don't throw out your skinny ties, right? You know, because I, I remember years ago, people putting the Chicago guys down when they were complaining about heat stress from their gear. And now we're like dealing with heat stress from our gear. So um, anyway, with officer development, it's very parochial. 
And, and I think that's good. It doesn't mean we can't borrow and rob and steal other people's stuff. But I think one of the things that, that, that I think is really um, important and, and what just in, during my career was that we try not to be somebody else. I mean, you try to develop your folks, so they fit into your system, right? And uh, every system being somewhat different. Like I, we had in my system, I had uh, engineers, we had senior men, engineers. Then we had acting officers who were kind of in that probationary phase. They'd passed all the tests and such, but they hadn't been promoted. Then we had lieutenants, then we had captains, and we had battalion chiefs and district chiefs and assistant chiefs, and we even had commanders in there. So we had a pretty interesting system, very slow, deliberate system that had assessment centers, hands-on physical assessment centers at every step of the way, and, and also had schools, not, not particularly long or deliberate schools, but pump school and, and you know, uh, HR school and all that stuff, which I think is really important. And, but back to the young man's letter. One of the things in the young man's uh, letter that he wants to publish on the community, which I thought was cute, was he said, you know, the old guys are always complaining and attitudes are contagious and, you know, they get, they're negative and it's a germ. And I said, I, I want to tell a kid, no, it's not. That's a really good thing. The, 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 when you get that fire department patch, that's a patch to wine. That's the license to wine. You're off probation. You got to complain about everything. You'd never leave, but you got to, oh, the chief stinks, you know, is Halton in the room? No, what a jerk. I hate him, right? That's that's what makes us, that's, that's fun. It's not bad. The old guys complain because they can. They earn the right to. The, the, the fire service is definitely uh, definitely good at that. I, I, I... Yeah, we, we ought to have a class in officer school about whining. <laughs> for firefighters. Yeah, hurt feelings. Exactly. Yeah. Bruised ego. All right. Well, uh, well, let's uh, we'll, we'll uh, move forward a little bit down the line here with uh, with some more intros. And I'll tell you what. Let's do an int uh, just do a quick intro and then head on into uh, into our discussion. I don't want to get too far behind the eight ball here on time uh, to get to get into some good uh, uh, get into some real good content here. So, Steve Shaw, I'll kick it to you. Give uh, give a little intro about yourself and what does it look like? Uh, what does the process in Fort Lauderdale look like to get promoted? And then once you do, what does that process look like? Are you are 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 there uh, you know NFPA ten 41 uh, officer one and two requirements are there uh you know what does that look like for you that process steve do you guys still have the bathing suit competition oh uh, yeah every day actually it's going on right now in the in the back room over there yes sir absolutely uh lifeguards are, are always uh helping us out with that yeah uh, uh yeah uh, in reference to the officer development um uh yeah here's uh i guess i guess each of us have their own take on uh priorities and who we consider most influential. Whenever I'm teaching an officer development program or helping another department teach in a portion of theirs, I always pose the question uh, to the group and that the question is always the same. Who do you feel is the most influential piece of the puzzle? Who by rank or by who they are or by position is the most influential? I get the results back and it's always interesting to see those results. They're all over the place. Some of them are the senior firefighter, the senior driver, the fire chief, the union president, the officer. I got to tell you, from my perspective, and this is just my personal thing, I'll, I'll, and like uh, Chief Alton was saying before, we're talking about fog versus smooth. I'll have debates with everybody on anything from smooth versus fog, transitional versus, uh, you know, interior attack, all that stuff. When it comes to who has the most influence on the company level, it, it's the company officer, hands down. I won't even have the debate with people. I won't even have the argument. I, I feel if you're not thinking that way, you're wrong. The company officer, whether it's captain or lieutenant, is the most influential piece of the puzzle. That is my personal take. Steve, so, Steve, you know what's nice about you is you're, you're so wishy-washy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and but here's where I'm going with this. If you combine the most influential person in the firehouse with the aspect of training, because I think training is the angle, it's the way, it's the path, it's that way to get to anybody in the fire service, it's the platform. You combine those two together, it's the perfect storm. It is the perfect storm. So every time I'm, I'm helping teach or, or helping organize officer development training, I can feel the weight of that because that's the best return on investment as far as I'm concerned. Um, at Fort Lauderdale, it's actually been up and down over the few years. Um, uh, before I came into training, we had a pretty uh, robust uh, program that happened uh, prior to coming in. Uh, when I came in, it priority set you know, between the fire boat and other things and this and that and the other things, and it kind of took a back step. 
we were able to get a, a short program going. Um, and we actually have one on the back burner right now in preparation for 2019, because for the first time we have not only a captain's list about to come out, but a fire rescue lieutenant's list coming out. So we have two groups that are going to be coming out at the same time in 2019. There's a need for this. There's an absolute need for solid officer development training. Uh, for us, it's uh, HR had to start from scratch for the, the rescue lieutenant because it was the first time we're putting it together. So we're looking around the area. Um, and when I say rescue lieutenant, I mean like the, 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 the medical rescue lieutenant. In right. South Florida, we say rescue. It's obviously the medical rescue. Um, but there are you know, several requirements like I'm sure you all have. Uh, so, you know, obviously, a written test. Uh, for us down here, we do the, the practical evaluations. Um, you have to get fire officer one and a host of other things. Uh, but even regardless of that, I think more importantly, is the after effects. What are you doing after that? Uh, for example, my brother works for Miami-Dade. He was actually working for uh, Captain Gusson for a long time. Got some hell of a good stories over there. But um, it, what the way they do in Miami-Dade is they take a written test and that's it. They take a written test and then put you through class. And I guess it depends how you look at that, but their, their program is so robust that it actually works for them. So I guess, and you mentioned it before, Chief, there's, everybody does it differently. Some departments do it this way, some departments do it that way. Um, but regardless of how you do it, it there's got to be something in place. There's got to be something in place for those officers coming in. And if you had to pick and choose of where you got to focus your attention, in my personal opinion, going back to what we said before, that's where it's got to be. Because those officers have so much input, so much value, so much effect on their crews, both up and down the chain. That's the best return on investment. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty fortunate. When I uh, when I took a poll between the Tri-County area around here, um, one of the things I do on the side is I'm the, uh, the chair of the training and education subcommittee for the Broward County uh, Fire Chiefs. I took a poll to see who was doing uh, in, uh, officer development training. And the good thing is most departments in our area are. And I've, we've visited several of their programs. We help out with some of the programs and they're quite good. So it's, it's nice to see that in the South Florida area the vast majority of people are taking officer development training seriously. And that's really nice to see with, you know, with the position. Steve, um, Steve will they, just real quickly, will, 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 once somebody gets promoted, will they get pulled off the line at all and put on 40 hours for a couple of weeks? Or, or what does that process look like after they get promoted? All right, good question. And here's why that's a good question. It's because it's also department specific. Some departments like ours, listen, pulling people off the roads and putting them on 40 hour work weeks, that's almost impossible. I mean, it really is with how busy we are. I know it's cliche to say we're busy. Everybody's busy. Listen, you know, we had some results done a couple of years ago and we were in the papers and, you know, the busiest rescue trucks, the busiest engine in the known universe. And for a while it was bragging rights. <laughs> now it's just like, this is ridiculous. We're just, we're just, this is crazy. So it comes down to priorities and my priorities don't always match the senior staff's priorities and such. They know it's important, but there's got to be that give and take. So in the past, for example, we've taken people, put them on 40 hours. We've done it where it's overtime. It's been back and forth. Steve, I will tell you, though. Steve, yes, sir. If I can interject one quick question to you. What do you think the key components of the officer development program in Fort Lauderdale are? In other words, is it communications? Is it HR? Is it tactics? But how do you break it down? And is there anything that, that you're doing that we, you would consider kind of unique or outside the outside the the uh, the, the normal scope because you know now, now we've got I, I, I do a, I do a little company officer class on the road and one of the sections I do now is social media which heck we didn't do five ten years ago there was no social media now you you got to train your officers about social media that's a that's a convoluted question. So thank you for asking, Chief. Appreciate that. That's why I um, make big money, bro. <laughs> well, this is this is what we had to, to deal with last time when we were coming up with our classes. We only were given a few days to put the class together. So the choice, the the the, the big thing was, what do you include in such a small a small period of time? You have some departments that have two to three weeks of officer development training down south. Two two to three weeks. That's amazing. God bless them. Um, other departments have less than less than a week, a few days. So what do you take? What What's your priorities versus my priorities versus the chief's priorities? Some are administrative, some are tactics. You have to really be careful what you're picking and choosing. Um, on a global answer to that question, it has to be a mix. It can't just be tactics. It can't be just admin. It's got to be 
relevant practical material. It's got to be some of the soft skills, definitely. You mentioned communication. Always, 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 always communication is an issue. Um, but it's hard to choose between those things. It really is. But I will say it has to be practical, practical and relevant. So, for example, if there's heavy topics that are happening in our area, we like to focus on those. Social media is a huge one right now. Uh, as it is for probably a lot of people. So that, of course, would be as part of our topic program. Communication, we mentioned. Um, it, it, it's, it's such a hard question to answer because my views are different from the next person and so on and so forth. Luckily, in the training, she's so I have a little more pull, but, but not much because I have bosses. So, <laughs> um, uh, but it, it's hard to choose. It really is. And then what I've noticed is, and, and this is the kind of the last thing I'll say is, um, there has to be one support and some sort of structure to having those classes. And a lot of the departments I know that have routine classes where it's just accepted, they're either written down in some solid way, either on a rule and reg or an SOP, or in some sort of union contract where it's it's what they will do. You get promoted, you will attend class. There's no, there's no gray area. There's like, well, if we have time. No, no, no. The best programs I've seen are ingrained. They're part of the system. It's not like an option. It's what you will do. And those are the strongest programs I've seen down here in the South. That's awesome. And, and the, uh, I'm just, I'm kind of curious and I want to hear from the other panelists as well, what they do as far as, as, as embedding the program into the daily shift and like a packet or something like that, that they do over time or, or pulling people off the line. We had, um, have, have done different things over the years in Dayton fire to where we, we did an overtime thing for a while, but it was, you know, it became fiscally impossible to do much more than a very short class, you know, a four hour class or something like that, or an eight hour class for all those folks on overtime. And so uh, we have just kind of revamped our officer development program. Uh, a gentleman named Mike Rice, that's a captain at our training center right now, has done a great job in, in creating a week long program to where financially it's not possible for us to pull you know, a dozen people, 15 people, 20 people off the line for a week to do it. However, um, what what, what uh, the, our training division, what our, our Captain Rice has started doing is pulling people off in small chunks. We're, a, we're not such a huge department that we can't, um, when we promote lieutenants and we promote captains, it's usually somewhere on the order of, you know, three to six people or something like that. And so it's possible with smaller groups like that to kind of pull them to our training division for a week and have a little bit more focused, intense program. We've had a lot of success with that. So um, anyways, I'll uh, hear what uh, everybody else has, has been doing as well. Chief Carroll, let's go to you. What's it look like once you get promoted in DC? Uh, good morning or afternoon now. Glad, uh, glad I could be here with you guys. But um, here what we do is uh, we give the guys, you know, a list of books they have to study. Uh, the test date is announced. There's a written test. Um, there's a um, in-basket exercise for a captain's level, but that's it. And then um, there actually, there is an assessment center, which is, you know, a videotaped um, answer to uh, a tactical consideration, a tactical exercise, um, a firehouse uh, scenario with, you know, a, a conflict resolution or management kind of thing of, of people. And then those two are put together and a list is, is published. So the disadvantage is, is that ultimately you could go from riding the backseat of a fire truck today to promotion to now you're in charge the next tour you come back. Um, there is a requirement for the entry level officer, which is a sergeant that's a fill in officer. Lieutenants need to be officer one, officer two. Uh, captains, officer three, and you know ICS three hundred and four hundred, that kind of stuff. But do you provide um, it, Chief? Do you provide that internally? Yes, yes. And really, what the issue has become is now we have we are right now in the process of applying for IFSAC approval for our supervisor one class, which which goes along with those NFPA uh, what is that ten twenty one um, requirements for officers. So um, we're going to be able to, to have our own. So we're not getting the IFSTA, IFSTA book out for officer training, which what that does for us is it allows us, our HR person comes in, our fire prevention, you know, our, our people come in and give us that as opposed to out of a, a textbook from, you know, from wherever it's written. And it, it makes it more, you know, homegrown. So that way, if a, if a, if a guy had had an officer one class, because he worked in Maryland somewhere, that's not going to, that's not good enough. We, we want you to have hours. Um, but that really is it. 
that's a two week class. They take them through uh, one week for officer two and stuff or supervisor two. And that's it. Um, I, we, we were struggling to really get some leadership training, like uh, maybe even some, some ethics stuff. It'd be great if we could put that uh, social media thing like you talk about into a class, um, but we're not there yet. I really think we need to, to do an officer investment, not necessarily officer development, but officer investment because um, it is the, the officer is really the most important tool or the most important cog in the wheel of our, of our department. Well, and, and, and a lot right. of folks, folks might not know, but Tony is uh, the author of Mayday Monday that he puts out every week for DC Fire. And DC Fire has been kind enough to allow us uh, to, to use it on fire engineering. And so Tony's had, when you're talking to Battalion Chief Carroll, uh, you have to remember you're dealing with a guy who's got 30 plus years of experience. He's got, he's not only his experience, but this guy's got education. He's got uh, incredible insight. And he's able to communicate in ways that when we're talking about social media, what he puts together uh, weekly, if you're not taking those and downloading those PDFs and distributing them, putting them up in your training academies and getting them out to your stations, there's company officer development every week from Battalion Chief Carroll. Tony, Tony not only puts those things together, but they're done in such a way that every single rank has a relevant aspect to it. it it's called Mayday Monday. But the, the depth of it is amazing. And, and David Rhodes and I and, and Eric Rhodes and I often look at that and discuss them weekly about the, the, the nuance and the character of it. I, I would say that, you know, Paul Combs is the artist of the fire service. I would say Tony Carroll is, is the, really the modern day social media uh, giant in terms of messaging relevant, pertinent information and training on a weekly basis, which is just phenomenal. So if you, if, for those of you out here who didn't know who Tony Carroll was, but you follow Mayday Monday, and if you're not following Mayday Monday, you're an idiot, because um, it's always something thought-provoking, it's always something useful, it's always done in a way that has those really, Chief Bernasini once said, any idiot can make something complicated. True genius is making it incredibly simple and clear. And, and the fire service owes a huge debt to Tony for, for doing that uh, week after week and obviously serving our nation and the community of DC, um, you know, protecting our, our senators and congressmen and our president and, and all of those incredible monuments as well as, you know, working with, I think Tony once told me that uh, when you're in DC and you go to a fire, you're working with like 30 agencies. Like people complain about two or three neighbors some of those properties have like 30 freaking agencies that you have to deal with, you know, because it's so complicated, but Tony, it's always great to hear your, your insight on it and, and just an amazing organization. I'm so proud to be an actual member of the bad boys society, which is a, which is a DC fire specific thing. I was inducted, uh, I think almost 25 years ago and, and, and you have to get there. It's a secret society um, of firefighters. And uh, I'm one of the few outsiders that I believe uh, that are inside the organization and, and on my bunker gear, I wear my bad boy pin. And uh, people always look at it and say, what's that? And they say, well, if you don't know, you, you're just not on the team. <laughs> you don't know, you don't know. You don't know, you don't know. Yeah, I, want, I, want to see, like, I want to see some he secret handshake here or something. There is. I'm not, I'm not in the club. You're not in you're not the bad boys yet? I'm not in it. No. no. no I, not I yet. My, I have my framed letter. It's amazing. We're from Turk, Turk 182. Who is the character in Turk 182? Um, He's the guy who runs the bad boy. What was it? It was Kilroy. Is the is the is the uh, guy on the the bad boy patch well, there? That, that's the Kilroy. Kilroy is the yeah. pin and the patch. But the the guy who signs the letter. If you saw Turk one eighty two, they used that guy. They used that character's name. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not in it. I don't know about that, Chief. Uh, <laughs> you may be getting a letter soon for your appearance yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, hey, uh, uh, Aaron. Let's go on around to you, brother. Let's. Uh, uh, well, how's the how's the uh, officer development program work once you get promoted to lieutenant? There is it. A, is it a, is it pr a pretty structured thing, or just some requirements you need to work towards, or what's that look like in Hamilton? Uh, train wreck. It looks like a train wreck. <laughs> it's uh, you know you can't sugarcoat it. New Jersey, we we um, we say we have all these rules. We say we do it all the right way. And I can tell you that when you take a civil service exam to be an officer in the state of New Jersey, the only requirement, literally the only requirement, other than I guess breathing and being upright, is that you have three years in the career fire service. 
and that's it. So I have three years on the job. I have the right to sit for a first level supervisor's exam, which in my department may be considered a captain or it may be a lieutenant. Um, but three years I could get on, I could do my three, I could take the test and be a really, really good student and sit at the top of the list. We have what they call rule of three in civil service where they can skip me. Uh, they can only, they, they have the right to choose from the top three uh, on the list. But um, the problem with it is there really isn't anything structured at a, at a state level. Uh, I, I know they've worked towards it, but um, again, in New Jersey, the other issue is state mandate, state pay. So my guess is that that won't happen anytime soon because if they mandate it, they've got to pay for the training and they're not going to do that. So it, it really is up to each department. Now, where I work in Hamilton, we're nine separate fire districts about to become one big department. Each, each district has kind of done their own thing. When I made captain a long, long time ago, they sent us um, all through NFA leadership one, two, and three. And it was good. It was really good. And it was taught by a really, really top shelf guy named Eddie Kensler, uh, who teaches a lot from the NFA. And I learned a lot. And I was fortunate to have been a volunteer fire officer. So I had a little bit of a grasp, but not nearly what I probably needed. Um, so that was good. But since then, we haven't done a mass promotion. We've only done one guy at a time. They've given him some, some training. They, they send you to Rutgers, uh, Rutgers State University. They, I, I put some notes here. They offer some good management courses, but there's nothing tactical about it. It's, it's more HR. It's more day-to-day -day how not to jam up your, your, your company or your government entity. Um, but it's really not – I really like where, where Tony said the, the officer investment. We don't have that officer investment. Now, talking with the chiefs, uh, as this new department comes into, into play, and it looks like we'll become a new fire department, the, the mayor and everybody tells us January 1st, um, it's going to be interesting. And, and officer development is going to be huge because we currently have some very seasoned officers who are outstanding. We have some young officers who are outstanding. And we have some officers who need education. You know, we have everything in between. So I think that that is going to be a huge key into how the new department goes forward because I agree completely with Steve. It all starts in the firehouse with the company officer. No matter how strong our chiefs are, if those lieutenants and captains and sergeants or, or whatever you may call them aren't really stepping up and showing leadership and understanding how to interact with their staff and, and just the everyday of, gosh, just eating dinner together. You know, I've seen such dysfunctional firehouses where we can't even get on the same meal plan together, you know? So it's just those everyday things to, to build and, and become a much more cohesive unit. Um, this morning, it's, it's 90 some degrees out. I've got a probie who's working on some things and uh, just coming off a, a medical, getting ready to get back on the rig. So as bad as it is, and it's 90 some degrees, this morning, you know, as the captain, I made the decision, we've got to get outside, we've got to do some stretching. We're an engine. You got to stretch. It's hot. We still have work to do. Younger officers might be intimidated and say, you know what? It's really hot out, guys. Let's take a break. I don't want to piss you off. There's always those differences, you know, and we don't have regulations in place yet that are really, really guiding us. So it's a lot of seat of the pants. We're fortunate. Again, we do a good job at fires, I think. Our guys do a good job, but um, we have a lot to learn. And just uh, just understanding, I think that the officer development stuff, when I was a volunteer chief, I really worked on it in, in the little town where I was. And um, I wanted to get everybody to understand what the other guy's role was and really interact with one another. Understand what the current officers are doing, why they're doing it, and what's going to be expected of you if you want to attain that next level. So these are the classes. And, and even in some of the volunteer companies, I know that um, New Egypt's a good example. For the bylaws, they have very strict um, officer development where you have to have attained these classes. And unfortunately, it's still an election process in a lot of volunteer places, but at least they have a strict guideline of this level of education. So it's a step. But um, unfortunately, we are all over the charts in New Jersey. We really, really are. And it's... Uh, 
We don't have assessment centers once you've gotten through the civil service system. Civil service is an assessment. You do a written and you do a um, uh, video where you're, you're presented a bunch of different problems. Um, but it's a step. But it's not necessarily a train wreck, huh? <laughs> that's my 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 view is a train wreck. When when in three years I can be a captain after never have been in the fire service, that's not a good system. It's just not a good system. Right, right. Not, you work. know, one thing uh, one thing, Aaron, that you mentioned, and, and again, the chief Carroll uh, had said initially that concept of our officer investment, and I think certainly we're all on the same page uh, with that. I I, thir I think that there is a uh, you know people you people use the term uh, in in politics and things trickle down economics, right? Well, there's a trickle down effect to that officer investment, right? It's it's trickle down. Development. It's trickled down. If, 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 if an organization is struggling for resources or if a training division is struggling for resources and thinking, OK, there's only there's only one thing or two things or three things that we've got to narrow this focus on. Man, that is one that you do not cut. You don't leave officer development and leave any kind of funds and any kind of, um, you know, uh, it, you know, interest or enthusiasm or whatever you can leave that to the absolute last on the chopping block because that has that trickle down effect. If you invest, you know, it, it financially, emotionally, development wise, everything, if you invest in those officers, uh, they'll see that there'll be a trickle down effect on those companies. And so that's not where uh, that's not where the cutting should ever start uh, because of that. If you if, if a training division is, is, is out of money and out of time, the one thing that you've got left for is officer development because you have to. That's that because it's going to have that trickle down effect. Um, just very briefly, we're kind of at the bottom of the hour here, a little bit late to mention this now. Um, but hashtag FE talk. If anybody has any questions or wants to contribute anything on social media, I'm trying to kind of keep an eye on that uh, on my phone as we go. I'm sure Chief Halton probably is as well. Um, so with that being said, I want to kick it back to the gentleman out in Oklahoma. What's uh, in, in Owasso, Oklahoma? What does the officer development program look like? Well, so Owasso is a, uh, fortunately right now we're in a growth cycle. So we're, we're getting ready to add on a, a pretty good, a sizable amount of firefighters. It's a real exciting time for us. It wouldn't be anybody. So right now I've, I've kind of started developing something. They're going to have to mandatory reading of Sun Tzu, Art of War, a revolving loop of uh, Gunny Highway quotes, and uh, you have to watch Cool Hand Loop. <laughs> now, actually, <laughs> it's, it's a little more like uh, – like what you got there in Jersey. I designed the program. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually a little more like what you've got in New Jersey. There's uh, once you get on the on the job here, uh, it's very similar to Tulsa, which is the department I just came from. It's a mid-sized department. I'm at a smaller department now. Uh, don't promote very often, but when they do, it's a very structured promotional process. But at three years on the job, you're eligible to make driver. And then with two more years, you're eligible to make, make captain. So you've got people that are promoting to company officer ranks that have one, maybe never driven and maybe never pumped a fire, uh, obviously never been in command of one. So it, it is an interesting situation. I can I can uh, I can empathize with you up there in New Jersey on the same thing. You get a little bit good and bad with both. So for me, it's more of a saturation point. Once you get on the job, it's a continuing process from day one. You're on the job. You're given some skills and some some uh, benchmarks for leadership. And unfortunately, I think in a lot of places, I don't think we're any different here. Uh, that, that kind of maybe go, goes from station to station, department to department, or even, even as small as house to house. Uh, and when you find those good company officers that are, that are, uh, they're builders or that building block, you kind of, you kind of put them, you plug them in and let them, let them run with it and let them teach as many as I can. Uh, I know that seems very simple and kind of uh, archaic and, and small minded, but it really kind of works. And, and I think to, to John's point, a, a lot of what we do in officer development, as we started with earlier, is going to be parochial, right? Now, in a state like New Jersey, um, even New Jersey, a, a lot of folks don't know, it's not as homogenous as you might imagine. It's not all Newark, it's not all Bergen County. When you get into the southern part of New Jersey, it's extremely rural. It's extremely rural. It's beachfront communities. It's, it's incredible communities when you head uh, west in, in southern New Jersey. It's, it's breathtakingly rural, farmland, uh, yeah. gorgeous, but mm -hmm. very, very rural. So when we start talking about creating an officer development program, uh, you know, to, to quote Jordan Peterson, who, the 12 Rules for Life, 
you have to start first inside, right? You have to look at your organization. What are the key skills? What are the key, you know, like, like I was asking Steve and, and Tony. Obviously, you know, Tony's in one of the most, you know, politically, well, he is the most politically charged environment in the world where, where some of the most important people in the world gather routinely, not just our country, but our, the visitors. You know, Steve is down there in Florida where you've got, you know, an amazing array of weather issues. You got the hurricane just, you know, breezing by your state right now, but issues like that constantly in Fort Lauderdale, what an incredible community. And, and, and Hamilton, where you're taking all of these incredible organizations, they're coming together. So all of that's parochial, right? So part of, part of Aaron's program might be, how do we blend organizations? How do we respect, you know, what they used to do on the floor or the pad or some of their, you know, idiosyncratic language, like stuff that was just local to them, um, you know, and, and, and make it work, right? Um, I, I just think that so often, and I think the NFA does a great job. It's a great program. And, and Aaron said that that's a great starter. If you don't have something, get a hold of the NFA. They do what are called on-site deliveries. They'll send out really good people um, and, and they'll deliver it right there in, in, in your own deal. And there's lots of guys and gals that have companies that do. Anthony Castro does a great job of it. Uh, Chief Salk and Chief Glasky do a great job of it. Kirk Isaacson does a, has a great school. There's lots of great guys. The IFSI does a great uh, the Instructor Society is a great school on officer development, company officer development. And some of them are two days, some of them are three days, some of them are, you know, a day. But do something, right? I think to everyone's point, do something. But I think the first thing you do is look at your community. Owasso is growing. I mean, it's growing fast. And, and infrastructure is coming in here that literally didn't exist in this community 10 years ago. They built a super Walmart. They built a you know, it, it's a huge growing because everybody wants to live in Oklahoma. I mean, who doesn't want to live in Oklahoma? It's the Riviera of, of America. And and so, right, because we have the largest inland seaport in, in the United States right here and in, 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 uh, just outside of uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Katusa, Port of Katusa, I'm not making that up. So you got all kinds of stuff going on in, in a lot of communities. Obviously, the more established communities, places like Fort Lauderdale, there's a high level of expectation among those people for customer service. That might have to be a focus of Steve's training, right? Interacting with the public. But for, for, for DC, man, you could be going into an embassy property. You better understand that you're on foreign soil when, you, when you're operating there because those folks own that land. So I think that there's so many parochial issues in the United States when it comes to company officer stuff that I think the first step is Jordan Peterson says in his wonderful book, 12 Rules for Life, if you haven't read it, you know, I'm always pitching books, but I think that would be a good book for young company officers coming to the system because it talks about first you got to take care of your own house. You got to clean up your own mess. You got to, you got to basically says you got to fix your room, right? Wherever you do business. And, and, and after you get done with that, then you can start trying to fix everybody else. But I think so often we, we start with fixing other people, right? It, it, you know, it, it's like everybody says people, it, it, everybody likes change except when it comes to them. You know what I mean? And then it sucks. So, you know, uh, so I, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw it back to the group uh, and Brad, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that's a, a tremendously good insight. Tremendously good insight. And the, in the uh, um, one of the things as we've kind of gone around, we've heard some of the challenges and I kind of wanted to flip the script a little bit. And, and Steve Shaw, I'll kick it back to you. What if you had a magic wand? If you had a magic wand where you had plenty of time and you could do whatever you wanted, you could pull guys off the line, you could leave them, you could set them up with another officer in a mentoring program on duty. You know, uh, dollars are unlimited. What does a magic wand officer development program look like for you? You, you got you got another couple hours or you, you, ready, you ready to go? All right. So, all right, listen. I think it, it, it's 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 the whole. All right, it's a big question. I'm gonna try to try to drill this down a little bit. So, before, during, after. Okay, before there has to be a mentoring program of some sorts. Where, as you said, you know, before uh, one of the problems was, you know, there only a few years before these 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 guys or gals become company officers. If that's if that's the hand you've been dealt, if that's the hand you've been dealt to where you only have a short time before they're going to be in that critical position then act as such, adjust as needed, give them the training that they need. So Steve, can beforehand. Steve, before you go, can I ask you a question on that? Yes, so you're talking about before they go, I think this is a critical piece of Brad's question, magic wand. For me, the magic wand would be, they'd have to have at least 
three to five years as a firefighter. They would have to have at least three to five years as an engineer, driving an apparatus, pumping, raising the aerial for me, okay. for my magic wand. And, and no, so you're right. Front yeah. end loading it, I would front end load. I think before you sit in, in, in the right seat and you're a company officer, you should have a minimum of eight to 10 years of experience before you start calling the shots on the fire ground for an organization the sizes that I came from. Now, for Lauderdale, might be bigger, smaller, and you might have to make those compromises with time. But I, I think that those are fundamental things. So for you, when you talk about front end loading, what are you talking about specifically? Now, I understand your question. And yeah, in a perfect world, you'd want that time as well. You can't really, you can't replace the time on the job. You can't replace all that experience you're getting from being in those different positions. So absolutely, and you're right. Magic wand wise, yes. So they have time on the job, absolutely. Um, but beforehand, prepping them for what they're going to experience, whether it's giving them certain classes or certain expectations. You must be a fire officer one or a fire officer two. You need to have this list of materials on. You have to have this fire officer checkbook signed off prior to even thinking about taking the test. Um, just everything your department specifically needs you to do prior to set them up for that. Prepare them, not just, oh, here, take a test. It has to be more than that. There has to be something more robust than that than just, Oh, I'm ready to take a test. No, that that's not enough. I'm sorry, that's not enough. Um, so beforehand, prepping the pre the pre test area, whether it's the time of the job, classes needed, and so on and so forth. Uh, testing process: a robust, healthy test, a proper evaluation of these folk. From written, okay, written's good. Evaluation, interviews, the whole nine yards. Get a good sense of what this person brings to the table. That serves two purposes. One, it gives you an idea of where they're at. Two, it gives you an idea of what you're not providing for them in your future company officers. So getting a really Steve, robust- how is that to, and, and I'm sorry, we keep interrupting you, but but how, how is that, that process with your magic wand, how is that weighted in terms of written tests versus the other soft skills? Is the written test pass fail or does it weigh, it, weigh into the process? Well, and one of the reasons I ask is we have a system in Dayton, our system is is vast majority, 95% of the of the weight of the promotional final list is written test score and then and then some seniority points. We don't do a, a good robust assessment center like that. And so so that's always an issue that's interesting to me as to how other departments see that. H how important is that written test component to your promotional process and what what should it be or could it be? Right now, the way it's weighted for us is depending on what test you're taking, the written component is between 50 and 60 or 50 and 40 percent, depending on, the, on the, the test you're taking. I don't disagree with that exactly. But uh, and again, just you're asking me with the magic wand. It's a part of it. It's not everything. It shouldn't just be a written portion. There's got to be a more of an assessment because there's just so many different avenues that helps with it helps the person prepare for something. They know they're coming into something bigger than just taking a written test. So that person coming in is preparing for more than just this. They they know they're going to be interviewing. They know they're going to be uh, talking to people, interacting, doing exercises, doing um, uh, subordinate counseling, whatever it is. It's just it, you get that better feel coming in, and you know more about that person when you're evaluating. It just that's just kind of how I see it. As for weights. That's just how we're doing it right now, where it's like 40 or 50 percent. Uh, I'm OK with that percentage wise. I just wouldn't go much higher, to be quite honest. Um, and then the after effect, no matter what you do, and again, magic wand time. To me, after you get done with that test, before you send them on the street, before they ride a truck out of service on days, two, three, whatever weeks you need, give them that good, formal, heavy class. This is what we expect to be soft skills, hard skills, tactics, strategies, everything. Have insiders do it, have outsiders do it. And this is kind of a side topic. You know, one of the big issues we've had last time was, well, what's more appropriate, doing an internal class with internal folk or having outsiders do portions of the class? And a lot of people have very different polarized views on what their thoughts were on that. I'm kind of in the middle. I like both. I like the, the, the homegrown folk, but I also like to bring an outside opinion as well. So that's just a, a you know snapshot of that, in my opinion, but it's got to be comprehensive from before, during, and then right after giving them that hard training so that you prep them correctly and give them a good baseline. There's no gray areas. This is what we expect. This is what we want you to do. We're empowering you, and we're giving you the authority and the responsibility to do your job. So that's, again, it goes back to me just really heavily weighing on that company officer position. It's a very important position. Um, 
Steve, I'm really sorry that we weren't able to find anything that you're passionate about to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I think that's uh, that's in, that, that 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 kind of, of passion and enthusiasm. I firmly believe is contagious, and I hope that uh, I hope that your company officers uh, uh, get to get to hear that straight from your mouth. That's good stuff. Tony Carroll, what about you? What uh, what's a magic wand for uh, officer development? Oh wow. Um... Yeah, I think that they the first thing they have to understand is that they have the lives of people in their hands. Um, I, you know, when we go from the back step of a fire truck where you're really concerned about maybe the checking out the tools, checking out the equipment to where now you're making decisions that can impact people. Um, that somehow we have to we have to get that into them. I don't know that we can. I made this sign up. Maybe this will help. Maybe if you guys can see it. It's not really a sign, right? <laughs> um, I've been busy making signs, so I, I don't. I mean, that's, that's, that's it. what did it say? It said the solution to all our problems. problems. Problems, and it's a mirror. That's awesome. So I, I don't know. I don't know how to. Uh, I mean, there's so much you could do. We could be like, like, like he said. He said a couple of hours to talk about it. Well, it's going to take a couple of months to really impart to them what they need to know. Um, SOGs, we have SOGs, which do really well. But uh, we're seeing that 90% of the time the SOGs fit. So there's 10% that they don't make fit. So how do we train them for, to get them ready for that? So it really is about investing in them with that training. Uh, we need soft skills. We need we need ethics. We need. Uh, I, I did some. I was able to go to a, a, a leadership development thing where they did. They did role playing. That was awesome. It was amazing. Again, that's not. That's not. That's not what we do. It's not comfortable. It's not, that, was that the glue well. guys, Tony? No, it, this was a. Um, I applied for it. It was a week away, at a you know in a resort, <laughs> or actually we were like in a camp, and we were able to do that. But if we could bring that in here. Um, you know, offer that to our guys. Um, those are the kinds of things I think that we really need. Uh, I don't know that we need social media stuff. I mean, we, de we definitely need something, but really could we just say stay off of social media? But um, we need those soft skills is what, what I think we, what, what they're going to really need. Somehow they, they, they also need to be updated on the, the current events of the fire service. That's what we miss out on a lot of here. Is you know we, we the guys aren't aren't really paying attention to what's going out going on in the fire service in general, which yes, there's a lot of stuff out there, but it, it can help us. It can it can it can keep you in the game, I think, and that's something that we're missing. How do I capture that? I, I don't know. I don't know how. how we funny. Do. I think that uh, for DC for the magic wand mandatory attendance at FDIC and EMS today at least three times before you're allowed to take a promotional exam, and, and I think that's just fair. I mean, I, I can't imagine not wanting to do that. That's what we want, fairness. Fairness, yeah. EMS today and FDIC. It only have to go minimum of three, but I think you could probably push it out to you know, 20 or 30. If we could get them to an NFA class, I think that that would, that would be a start. We recently held um, one of those ones at Difficult Conversations. Oh, yeah, we yeah. Had six, we had six, seven people show up. Seriously? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's the kind of things that we're not getting. We're not getting the word to our people that 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 it, it's not mandatory, but it's going to help you. It's really going to help you. So that that's where we struggle. I don't think it would take a whole lot to 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 put a little bit of of ownership on the guys. Um, you know, when they get promoted, I don't know that they they under, truly understand the responsibility they have for them. So somehow we need to impart that if it's. If it's a one week school, two week school, that would be that would be great. Right now, we do the officer one. We're calling a supervisor because we're modifying it to our thing. But that's that's really what we're doing, and that's not enough. That doesn't really get them ready to ride the front seat of the fire truck. Yeah, the uh, one of the things that I'm that, that I've kind of pushed for within our, our our own organization, and we're currently in the process of of potentially trying to upgrade our our uh, our, our our flash can or whatever you want to call it, uh, um, our 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 
you know, phase one survival systems type of uh, hands-on flashover container. I, I think that's something that is that, that needs to be, is oftentimes not talked about in officer development programs is a, a live fire component. And maybe that's a little, maybe that's a little bit of a myopic view, but um, we have a situation in, in Dayton where our lieutenants are assigned to engine companies and, and captains ride ladder trucks. And so everybody once they get promoted to lieutenant ends up going to an engine company. And so we have firefighters that have ridden a ladder truck for a long time that maybe their 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 focus has been there, and so now they get promoted, and now they're in charge of an engine company, haven't spent the last six eight years on a truck company, and so we are trying to incorporate some more tactics stuff into our into our week long officer development class as well. And I think, especially with uh, you know all of the discussion about modern fire dynamics and things like that, a component of live fire in that officer development program, whether it be a week two weeks whatever, but some tactics stuff, some live fire stuff, putting everybody. Um, and, and, and again, I'm, I'm focusing on that one specific kind of simple issue of that flashover container, but I'm kind of passionate about that because that's one of those things where it doesn't matter if you've got a, a, a if you're in drill school and you've got two months on the job, or if you're a 20 year guy, 30 year guy, that's one of those interesting tools that we have in the training aspect of our industry where everybody thinks that that's pretty neat. And everybody leaves that day having watched all of that fire behavior and things ho happening over top of their heads and, and wrap their mind around those important concepts um, that, that it doesn't matter where you are in your career, that's always a cool day. And I think somebody going from firefighter to now suddenly making those safety decisions, those go, no go decisions, when to go, when to pull out and all that kind of stuff, really uh, pounding them some, some uh, fire behavior knowledge. Uh, and even in a hands-on aspect, pounding some uh, fire behavior knowledge into their head is something that's really important as well. And something that we're going to, I believe, start going to as part of our one week officer development class as well. So just uh, another random thought to throw in there. So we only have a couple of minutes left. So let's really briefly go down the line uh, with uh, some closing thoughts, uh, some, some closing, closing thoughts from everybody. Steve Shaw, let's start it down in Florida. I'm glad we had this conversation. Obviously, I'm, I'm a little bit biased. Uh, and as I said before, I think you combine the company officer plus the fact that they are able to to have that platform of training on at multiple levels. You combine them to you have a really solid formula for success. You got to treat the company officer training. You got to treat the company officer as, as what it is, is the most influential piece of the puzzle of the firehouse. And if you're going to give them a program, you got to treat it seriously. You got to make sure that you got the support. The, the, the sport, the backing for that program, and really just put a lot of effort into making sure that they know when they go to that class and they know they're put in that position, that they're given the responsibility, the authority, the, the empowerment to do that job. It is probably the one of the most important things an organization could put effort and resources into is that company officer training academy or company officer training program. We, uh, we lost Aaron Heller. I think he had to jump off to go on a run out there. He's on duty on, on shift today, so uh, I'll say goodbye on his behalf. I'll, let's kick it out to Oklahoma. Some final thoughts? Thank you. Uh, I'll have to tag on with Steve there and say that uh, if uh, having a robust testing process, uh, kind of test all the skills, all the knowledge, everything that they, they built themselves up to is great. Uh, but I think even more important, as we all know, if you, you fall to the level of your training, you don't rise to it. So if, if you're not developing from, you know, as soon as these people become relief drivers, that's what we call them here, relief drivers. So as soon as they're able to drive a rig uh, without the rank, and then they start being developed on, on some leadership aspects on the job, uh, whether it be a company level or, or, or job level. But I think without that and without having that, that solid background and those, those years of reps and steps, I think when the testing process time comes, I think that's sometimes why we fall short. You know, in my experience, just uh, now being in the volunteers fire service, but having been on the career side for 30 plus years, I think that, you know, it's always evolving, right? So I don't think that officer development or company officer development ever ends. And I think that through a training academy, a good training academy, you can continuously put out snippets, right? So we heard a lot of folks saying, hey, you can't do you know, two weeks, you can't do 10 days. I get that. But I think what we, we need to do is look at the uh, ability of the training academy to at least put out small bits and pieces, right? Maybe an HR piece, maybe a social media piece, maybe a tactics piece, and keep that ever-evolving company officer development on the, on the boilerplate, much like we do with the rest of our, you know, quals and certs that we have to maintain. And it's going to be different no matter where you go. 
And the other thing, in all honesty, a place like FDIC, where you go to FDIC and there's dozens of courses going to be offered this year about company officer development and all kinds of instructors. And, and those men and women are willing to go anywhere, anytime, and, and do their program. And yes, some of them has to be paid for it. Well, for a lot of them, it's their business, right? It's how they're supporting their families and they have other issues. So, you know, it, it, and if they're good, they're worth it. So think about that. I mean, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, there's, there's a lot of great programs out there. If you're doing something, ask, put it out on social media, ask folks, hey, uh, what do you do about your, about your company officer program? What do you do about, uh, you know, uh, getting folks to take training? You know, it's a big issue. And I, I think that, you know, the, why I love this hangout is that no matter what the problem was when I was in the fire service, especially when I ran the training academy, and even when I, as soon as I made officer, if there was a problem, the first guys we looked to were the training officers. And, and it, it always falls on the training officer. And Steve, Steve is wearing those broad shoulders now. And it, it, if you had the magic wand and you want to do a company officer school, heck, it might be six months if you want to do it perfectly. But you got to pick what's the most critical stuff we need to do today. And, and Tony said it, people's lives are at stake, civilians' lives and firefighters' lives. And, and how we emulate that behavior of an officer, I think is critically important. You know, the, the military model of what an officer does and how an officer behaves, you know, you're not one of the, you're not one of the troops anymore. You're an officer and, and you have to act like that, right? Doesn't mean you can't have a good time and let your hair down when you're off the, off the job. Doesn't mean you can't enjoy a good joke from time to time, but there's a little bit of separation. And it's because specifically it has to do with what Tony said so well, people's lives are at stake. They're in your hands. You get to make decisions that put people in harm's way intentionally. You, you better be ready to do that and live with the consequences as every man on this panel has. <clears throat> and, and, and some of them don't work out so well. And, and, and we, we live with it. You know, we second guess ourselves. We go through all kinds of things. But the preparation side of it, it's about lifelong long learning. And, and it never ends. If you think you can go to company officer school for two weeks, six weeks, heck, eight, six months, and then be ready, you're a fool. Because things are changing all the time. Uh, you know, the, and if you're not paying attention, and, and Tony said it again, to go back to Tony, he said, you know, one of the biggest problems he has, is how do we motivate our folks to want to be connected to what's going on in the world around us? And if the only thing that's motivating your people is money, um, that's a real problem. And, and I don't know how you get past that. And I see that in a lot of, a lot of uh, organizations and a lot of uh, fire cultures where the, the folks will take training if they're getting paid to go, but they won't. They won't go if it's on their dime. And I guess that's always going to be that way, right? We're going to have different levels of interest. But when we have those highly motivated people that are willing to go to those schools on their own time for free, we ought to provide them with the best experience we possibly can. And, and if you're looking for that experience, contact Tanya Hoover. She runs the NFA. Get a hold of them. Contact people like Tony Carroll. I know he travels and teaches. Aaron does. Contact Steve. He's brilliant. Get a hold of Brad. He'll put you in touch with the, the incredible cadre of people who are with the International Association of Fire Service Instructors, who are, are just some of the best people in the world. And, and, and they're doing it. They're actually doing an instructor academy uh, coming up what, later this month. Right, Brad? Yeah. So we've got uh, uh, I appreciate that, Chief. Yeah, we've got our, uh, our fall instructor development conference coming up in Tinley Park, Illinois, which is just outside of Chicago. That's Forest Reader's Place. And uh, so, yeah, going to have a, a great group up there. And when you think about it, guys, I mean, let's be honest about it. What's the most important thing that a company officer does is he trains his people. It's all about training. At the end of the day, life is all about training. And, and if you're not ready for that, if you're not ready for that reality, then you, you've picked the wrong profession. Uh, you know, it, it, we, it's all about training and drill. That never ends. And, and where we do it, how we do it is going to be nuanced from organization to organization. But if that, if you don't think that I have a coffee mug and I can't quote it exactly because I don't use that kind of language, but if you don't think that training is the most important thing in, 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 in the fire service, then you're the biggest on the face of the planet and you can fill in the, the word you like for your own vernacular. But I got that mug. and, and I, I, I need that mug. I like that. Yeah. And you know who gave me that mug was a uh, uh, Mike Dowling from, uh, um, uh, Metro Dade down yeah. in Florida. Brilliant guy. Another guy. If you want to bring somebody in, hell, bring in Dowling. The guy's <laughs> freaking brilliant. 
literally freaking brilliant. So anyway, there's there's all kinds of ways to do it. Um, look at the incredible resources that are available. And, and I guess the, the number one thing is just keep going. Just show up. Keep going. You know, uh, keep going. Keep smiling. Keep having a good time. You know, the it, it, when you're laughing and having a good time, it, it drives people crazy because they can't understand why you're so damn happy. And uh, every man on this panel today is one of those people, right? Well, maybe not Aaron. He's left the room to keep talking about him. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oh, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for thank you for joining us today. I hope there was something worthwhile. Brad, you're you're an amazing host. Tony, Stephen, you know, I was I was making fun of Stephen while I was talking with my. I was looking at these two characters, right? The the Joe Handsome and Joe Handsome are there. I mean, you guys are like right out of central casting for the fire service. And then people see little old men like me, and they say, "Well, you're a firefighter." I'm like, "Well, I kind of used to be." But you know, when you see you know uh, the, the, these two, you know. Guys, just at Brad, I mean, my gosh, you know, oftentimes people ask me, like, oh, you firefighters today aren't like we were. I'm like, yeah, no, they're a lot better. They're a lot smarter. They're a lot bigger, you know. So. All right. Well, we uh, we sure uh, appreciate the uh, the opportunity to be on again, Chief Halton. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. The, uh, everybody at the Fire Engineering Clarion family for having us on again the uh, first Wednesday of the month. We really appreciate it. And uh that's uh, I think oh. that's it. We've, we've already gone over a little one, bit. So we'll one, one, one thing I know we're a few minutes over, but one important thing before we go, um, we're just uh, unfortunately we're just um, six days away from September 11th, and uh, that's a really important day. Um, I'm never available that day uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, I'll be in D.C. this year, Tony. I'll be at the Pentagon. Um, I've never done that on September 11th before, so I'm I'm, uh, I'm coming to uh, Baltimore on the uh, 9th and on the 11th I'll uh, I'm going to go to our nation's capital. Um, everybody does it, and I like it about September 11th that everybody deals with it in their own way. Um, uh, I, I detest when people try to say, "Well, make it a national day of this," or you know, uh, no, it's it's really personal. Um, every man in this group lost somebody that day in, in one of those locations, somebody they knew, somebody they loved, somebody they took a class from. Um, so it's serious stuff for us. Um, a lot of the public doesn't get that anymore and that's okay. Um, when you talk to folks from my uh, mom's generation, it's like D-Day uh, was to them. Um, it was an attack on our nation, on our principles, on our values. We lost people we love and 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 we'll always respect and remember. So with that day coming, um, I just wanted to say before we end, um, keep those people in your thoughts and prayers. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, everybody.